All right, so we're beginning an interview with uh, Mr. John Fleming. Uh, we are in St. John's, Newfoundland, and uh, the date is November 27th, 2015. Uh, and the interviewer will be William McRae. So to begin, could you just uh, please say your full name? John Michael Fleming. And your age, please. I'm 74. And uh, where uh, were you born? I was born here in St. John's, and uh, although this is just where my mother came to give birth, my uh, childhood home was really on Bell Island, uh, also known as Wabana, okay. which isn't too far from St. John. So that's where you grew up? That's where I grew up, yeah. And what did you do uh, as, a, as a child? What were your go-to activities? My go-to activities? Uh, Bell Island is an interesting place. It's an old mining town. Where there's an iron ore, a submarine uh, iron ore mines that are since closed. But it was also a very rural place. And uh, right in the vicinity of where I lived, there were sort of numerous horses and people rowing things and building things and whatever. And I went from one to the other and uh, hung out a lot at a sort of a general dealer kind of grocery building supply place, which was quite near where I lived. And, and uh, just helped out there and did whatever I could to be close to the horses. And, yeah. Yeah. So explored, helped out. Mm. And uh, what did your parents do? I, uh, my father <coughs> was a pharmacist, and he had a drugstore on Bell Island. Um, didn't call themselves pharmacists then, they were druggists. <laughs> and uh, so he became a druggist before Confederation, of course. And um, so the rules changed for him a little bit after Confederation. My mother was a stay-at-home housekeeper, and uh, we lived quite near the store so uh, we just walked everywhere huh? yeah and um, so you said you lived in a mining town uh, was there an interest for that kind of thing early on in your life I can't say that I was particularly interested in mining but mining dominated the town it was uh, it was the Wabana iron ore mines which are well known in mining circles uh, it supplied iron ore to the Sydney steel mills and uh, also to places like Europe and um, operated from like 1895 up to 1966. And so I grew up in the middle of that. So certainly knew about it, knew a lot about it, but I didn't, and I worked there after I graduated for a year and a half. Okay. But uh, until I went into geology, I really didn't have much interest in the, mm -hmm. in the mines, no. What were your interests academically as a child? Oh, they ranged all over the place. I don't think I was a particularly good student. <laughs> So uh, I can't say that I had any one favorite subject. Okay. And um, from, I guess, from high school into after that, what, uh, what were your plans? What were you thinking of doing? Um, I didn't particularly know, to tell you the truth. I, uh, I came to St. John's to go to high school. I went to a boarding school here in St. John's. And when I graduated from there, I went to university uh, at St. Francis Xavier in Nova Scotia. And my first year, I did just a general liberal arts program and switched to geology in the second year. It wasn't anything I'd thought a lot about doing beforehand. And um, switched to geology, I guess, mainly because a friend of mine who was also from Bell Island was doing geology and it seemed like an interesting thing to do. So I said, oh, I'll give that a try. Okay. So <clears throat> there you went. So really out of, uh, you hadn't had previous interests necessarily in geology. I can't say that I did. I was very young. We were yeah. all young, graduating from high school. Then I was only barely sixteen when I started university, and uh, uh, so you're kind of learning what you what you'd like to do. You know? uh -huh. yeah. So, did you specialize in anything in particular? Uh, if I can said to have specialized in geology, I specialized in uh, in uh, petrology, the petrology of volcanic rocks, primarily. And that's what I did my master's thesis on. But I quickly became an armchair geologist because I went to work for government and became a, sort of an administrator, manager, more than more than a geologist. Okay. Uh, what, what would you consider to be your first uh, employment, your first official job? Uh, my first job in geology, you mean? Or? Sure. Uh, well, it would have been a summer job. I worked okay. um, for the Geological Survey of Canada in the field. I worked both here in Newfoundland and I worked in Quebec and in the Northwest Territories. My first job after graduation 
was back in my hometown and working for the Dominion Steel and Coal Corporation as a the there were just two geologists, the senior guy and myself, and uh, we did all, all the geology for the mine. Okay. Um, can you tell me a bit about the where you, um, as a as a summer student, the um, the areas where you explored as a geologist? Uh, as a summer student, I worked. Uh, my first job was working in what's called Sandy Lake West Half Sheet, which is in central western Newfoundland, and. Um, uh, this was working for uh, Dr. Ward Neal, who was well, well known in geological circles, who was then with the Geological Survey of Canada. Subsequently became head of the geology department at Memorial University. Uh, my second year, I, I worked for, for the survey. It was in Quebec in the Eastern Townships, working for a guy who was a prophet uh, at McGill. And uh, and just let me see. After I graduated, I guess I, I went after I went back to university, following my job on Bell Island, I uh, I ended up doing geology again, doing a master's, and I'd worked a summer in the uh, in the Northwest Territories. How was that? That was good. That was quite different. Uh, way up in the barren lands and and uh, uh, <clears throat> very isolated, and but quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Uh... I ask this question to geologists especially because um, I often get kind of two types of geologists. You have the ones who they say, you know, their entire life that's what they love to do is to be out in the bush, mm -hmm. um, you know, never be at the same place, never have a stable mm -hmm. office. Uh, or the opposite, say they've tried the bush and uh, it's enough for them. They want more of a, you know, of a stable location, mm -hmm. not necessarily in those uh, crazy temperatures and stuff like that. Right. What mm -hmm. uh, What's your take on it? Well, I guess I ended up in the latter group, uh, not because I particularly didn't like going in the bush or anything, but um, it's certain that the the latter is certainly more conducive to family life. Mm. And um, uh, early on in my career, I went to work for the Newfoundland government in the geological survey there, and we were a growing, just a small group that grew into a rather substantial geological survey. So I quickly became involved in the work of just establishing that survey and organizing it and get it going, and um, so in the process, didn't didn't do a whole lot of field work after 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 that. Yeah. So how did you uh, start uh, working for the government? Again, it was um, um, just a, a matter of convenience at the time. I had just finished the the coursework for my master's degree, and I still hadn't finished my thesis. I was getting married, and uh, a job came up in the in the department of what was then called mines, Ag mines agriculture and resources uh, at the Newfoundland government. So it seemed like a good idea, so I went to work there. And Thirty years later, I left there. <laughs> and what was the position? Uh, I was a when staff geologist and okay. did all manner of geological work that came up. And, um, but as I said, it was it was a fledgling geological survey, and um, it was an interesting time in Newfoundland because things were changing politically, very uh, dramatically. Things were changing economically, and it was an opportune time to think about re-establishing the geological survey. You know, there had been a very active survey in Newfoundland uh, for the previous hundred years or so. It started in 1867. Um, but had gone into remission, if you will, at Confederation because under the terms of union between Newfoundland and Canada, Canada was responsible for geological surveys. But it quickly became evident that the Geological Survey of Canada wasn't going to be doing the uh, geology of the province in sufficient detail to be able to support mining interests, for example. So it was necessary to really start to do things here. And um, so a, a variety of interests came together, as I said, and uh, there was a huge political change when uh, the, the government of Joseph Smallwood finally gave way. And we had a more 
business-like government established, and they were very interested in doing things that were going to diversify the economy of the province. So the whole thing led to a, an effort to reestablish the geological survey, and that's what that's what we did, and we were quite successful at it. When uh, do you remember roughly when uh, that was reestablished? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> fairly precisely. I went to work for the. Uh, Newfoundland government in 1966 and the Smallwood government finally fell at the end of 71 I think and in the in in the interim uh, we were very active our little group within the uh, within the Department of Mines in sort of planning what might be done and what could be done at the same time there was a developing interest in the government of Canada in regional development and they established the Department of Regional Economic Expansion and it was that department which was called DRE that provided most of the funding for the work by ourselves and the Geological Survey of Canada to to really get this thing going in Newfoundland and it established a, a full-fledged fully functioning geological survey eventually which has is still going quite strong and doing good work. But provincially. More about, provincially, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's funny too, I, I mean, I'm no geologist, but uh, I mean, I've heard uh, Newfoundland has some of the, I mean, some of the most interesting uh, rocks and, I mean, mm -hmm. lands mm -hmm. in the world. Right. Some of the oldest, right? Uh, yeah, some of the, some of the oldest <coughs> in, in northern Labrador. Um, uh, not, not the oldest rocks, but Getting, getting yeah, there. Yeah, some. <laughs> yeah. And so there's quite a variety because uh, Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland, is part of the Appalachian Belt, the Appalachian Caledonia Belt, which um, stretches all the way from Texas to uh, Scandinavia. And uh, or whereas, New, whereas Labrador is entirely a part of the Canadian Shield with a whole variety of pre Cambrian geology. And um, so it's a, yeah, it's geologically, it's a very interesting place. Yeah. So uh, could you just take me quickly through through your your career, uh, your thirty year career in the government, and then maybe I'll stop you here and there. <laughs> well, um, as I said, I started working there in 1966. I worked for the the mines branch or Department of Mines or various iterations of it. It was Mines Agriculture and Resources first when I <clears throat> first when I started. Um, but it, it became other things, natural resources, Department of Mines, whatever. And I was in that department until 1989, I think it was. Um, I started in the, what was called the Mineral Development Division, which became some uh, Mineral Resources Division, I guess, eventually renamed the Geological Survey. Um, I became director of that division, director effectively of the survey. Then I became uh, assistant deputy minister of mines. Uh, what year? I don't remember. <laughs> um, I then became, I moved from there to the energy branch and I was deputy, uh, assistant deputy minister of energy for a while. Okay. Uh, involved in things like energy conservation and a whole lot of things like that. And then I went back to the mine side of things as deputy minister. And um, what then, kind of responsibilities did you have as a deputy minister of mines? Well, I was responsible for all. It was then a department of mines, department of mines only. Okay. And so I was responsible for the whole department and working with the minister and the premier at the time. And. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Then the government changed again in 89, I think. And that's when I moved to the Department of Environment and became Deputy Minister of what was then called Environment and Lands. And I was there until I uh, left the government in 1996. Okay. Can you tell me a bit about uh, the energy conservation portion of your career? Well, um, there were sort of multiple sides to energy at the time. We were, our offshore industry was just getting going. Uh, there, it was just exploration at the time. And respond, primary responsibility for that was hived off to a separate 
uh, a separate institution called the Petroleum Directorate. And what we had left in the department was an energy branch that was responsible for everything else. Okay, and there was a great interest in the time, at the time, both in the province and again federally, in promoting energy conservation, um, you know, sustainable energy development, that kind of thing. So again, it was a federal provincial agreement that we spent a lot of time administering. Um, energy conservation, and I forget the exact title of the agreement now, but we spent a lot of time uh, uh, or, and a lot of money uh, looking at alter alternative energy sources. Okay. Like I remember we put some money into peak development, uh, promoting uh, greater levels of uh, energy conservation in the residential sector, the business sector, and government. Um, Have you seen that change throughout your career? The the um, uh, especially the residential or or the conserving energy from a, a user perspective. Oh, very much so. Yeah, there was very little bit interest then, and uh, one of the personal developments out of that was uh, in the early eighties. Um, the early eighties. I just wonder if I got my ears screwed up. No, I no, I haven't. No, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I was ADM of Energy uh, sometime in the early 80s, and my wife and I ended up building a new house. We had already built one house, and so we decided to build it as an R2000 house, which is one of the things that the department was promoting. And um, uh, so I guess out of what I learned uh, as a uh, a per person working in the field, I learned the benefits of doing that. So we're still living in that house 31 years later, and it's it paid off immensely, I think, yeah. in terms of energy costs. And yeah, I mean, it, it is the uh, the the highest use of energy in Canada is yeah. heat, heating and cooling. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, mm -hmm. you get that done properly, it'll save right. a lot of energy yeah. and money in the long run. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and and in industry, of course, there's been a sea change in people's use of, in, in, of energy and, and the costs involved just drive that primarily. You know. Okay. And has there, uh, you mentioned uh, other sources of energy. Uh, ha during your time, were there any sources of energy that were truly developed? I, I, can't, province, I can't say that it, that it was. Newfoundland is not a particularly uh, good place to develop alternative sources of energy. We did, as I mentioned, we tried to promote uh, the use of peat as a fuel, which uh, had a limited degree of success, but the, the peat bogs that were eventually turned into sources of fuel have since become uh, sources of horticultural peat and a material for absorbing oil in oil, in okay. oil spills. So it had economic spin-offs, but not not in the energy area that we anticipated. To begin with. Okay. And um, different question here um, altogether, but uh, throughout your career, uh, can you think of a, a period or even a specific project where um, it didn't go as you wish, or it was quite dysfunctional? Um, well, I guess my my first job in, in my first permanent job was uh, with a, a slightly dysfunctional organization because the iron ore mines on Bell Island had been experiencing some difficulty for quite some time. These were underground mines and submarine mines. At the same time, they had the huge open pit mines developing in Labrador and in Brazil. They could produce ore uh, much more cheaply than we could on Bell Island. So Bell Island was really seeing its, uh, the Wavana mines were seeing its last days. Mm -hmm. It finally closed in, 90, in uh, 1966, and uh, this was about three years after I left there. And, uh, so it was an interesting place to live, to to work, but uh, it was. I think you would see the writing on the wall, you know. So it was a little dysfunctional, as you say, <laughs> as because people could kind of see the end. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people were very nervous 
Uh, it was a big community. Uh, but I think that one stage was 14,000 people. Right. Wow. And um, it's probably now about 3,000 people or 4,000 people. And um, so the closure of the mine was quite, quite traumatic. An interesting um, side effect of that was after I went to work for government, uh, we hosted the Mines Ministers Conference for the first time, I think it was in 76. Um, and the Mines Ministers Conference was a rather large affair then. Each minister would come from all the provinces with a large delegation that uh, included their own officials as well as people from the industry. And, but the theme of, of the conference that year was the social effects of mining. And so we took them on all to Bell Island to show them what a former mining town looked like. So it was interesting to go back to uh, what was my hometown and the place where I worked for a little bit and show all these, these people uh, what that looked like. And we actually held the, the, a series of talks in a hall that was about uh, 200 yards from what was our family home. Okay. And uh, it was as called the CLB Armory. And uh, we had some talks in there and uh, drove people around and gave them lunch. And anyway, it was a, a good lesson in the social effects of mining. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Pretty sad to yeah. go back to a yeah. community that's, well, yeah. Yeah, it happens a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we were mentioning the, the Atlantic provinces, but it, I mean, it happens a lot mm -hmm. in the natural resources world, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, <clears throat> have you uh, joined, throughout your career, have you joined any professional organizations? Uh, yes, um, the standard ones, I guess. I'm a, m a member of the Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. Um, also a member of the Geological Association of Canada. And I've been a member of the Prospectors Developers Association and whatever. Have you played any roles or? Um... Uh, uh, yeah, I played a role in uh, not the prospectors developers, but certainly the CIM and GAC uh, was active in. There was a local uh, <clears throat> branch of the Geological Association of Canada here, and I served on the executive of that and organized things. And um, we we we've hosted the, uh, the the national meeting of the Geological Association of Canada, Mineralogical Association of Canada, a couple of times. I think I chaired the committee that organized the first one in 1988. And the same with, with CIM. Um, there's a very active CIM branch here, been active since the early 50s. And um, I chaired that, oh, maybe four or five years ago, I guess. And uh, it has an annual meeting uh, that's one of the, the the noteworthy ones. You can talk to people across the country. A lot, a lot of people will enjoy having come here for the CIM Newfoundland meeting. Yeah. <laughs> um, completely different question here, but um, you might have a, a neat perspective considering you've grown up um, in a mining community, mm -hmm. basically a community that depended entirely on mining, mm -hmm. and then working uh, in the government uh, throughout your, your career. But do you believe there's a disconnect between the general public and uh, the natural resource world in Canada? Uh, somewhat, I think. Um, mining is a, is a hard sell for a large portion of the, of the public. I kind of like to refer to mining as kind of the, it's kind of the sea hunt of the industrial world. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the hunting of, of white coat seals which was an established industry here for many years, has gotten a bad rap from a lot of people. Very hard for urban people to understand. And I think the, the mining industry is somewhat the same way. The industry, mining industry is mostly remote from urban populations. Um, people don't know very much about how it's done. They know it digs big holes. They hear about the disasters. Uh, and they don't often hear about the very positive aspects of, of uh, mining and mining exploration. And uh, so I think it's an up, a, constantly an uphill battle for the industry to 
make itself heard in a positive way, to let people see it more for what it is, not just see the negative sides of it. Do you think, do you think companies in the industry do a big enough, play a big enough role or do a good enough job of, um, of expressing that to the public? It's certainly become uh, a hell of a lot better. Companies have become much more adept at, well, every company these days uh, has to have, you know, before they can operate, uh, we need our social license, as is put, which means we have to establish a positive relationship with the, the public that we're dealing with in the immediate area. And uh, so companies work, most companies work very hard at doing that. And um, whereas I think uh, historically companies paid very li little heed to that, and they weren't awfully different from the rest of heavy industry in that respect. But um, um, whereas a lot of people might learn a lot about manufacturing of various sorts, they, they're not exposed to mining a whole hell of a lot. So it's, it's constantly an uphill battle, I think, for, for companies to, to establish those positive relationships that they need. But it has improved enormously. I mean, mm -hmm. Companies have become a hell of a lot better at, at doing what they need to do. Yeah, yeah, and, and if you look, if you had just mentioned the social, um, social responsibility or the, mm -hmm. the license uh, <coughs> to operate, mm -hmm. social license to operate, um, that I mean is kind of a given now almost yes. with, with every single company mm -hmm. you have these uh, almost apartments or, or people that are hired specifically for sustainable development and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you also have the laws that have changed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, government. They have the laws have changed, so. and they're changing even now, becoming yeah. more stringent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so so back to um, a bit on this topic. Uh, you uh, you became a consultant after before. I left government. Yeah, yeah. I, I became a, a consultant, which for some people is a euphemism for unemployed. But yeah, I managed well, <laughs> in this in this industry. It seems like a. <laughs> The first stage of retirement, that's right? What it yeah, sounds like. yeah, but but not real retirement, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but as consultant in the natural resource and uh, environmental management, um, could could you talk about a few of the the big cases you've worked on? A few of the interesting cases. Uh, well, I did um, um, environmentally. I did a couple of um, projects for the Canadian Council of Ministers of Environment, which proved to be interesting. Interesting. That's an organization that I had worked with as a deputy minister of environment, including hiring a, um, a new executive director for the organization, um, which led me to use my rather limited French and uh, to interview people and so forth. But uh, so that, that was quite an interesting thing to do and to, to find the right person that sort of um, was able to hit it off with uh, people from all these provincial and federal jurisdictions. Um, in the, uh, on the mining side of things or geological side of things, I did um, some work for, for the Department of Mines again and looking at the geological survey and uh, making forward plans and we convened a large meeting of, of um, uh, the survey and its users to uh, talk about the survey and what it might do and what it should do and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, while working as director of the province's geological survey and deputy minister uh, of the Department of Mines, um, were there any rules or regulations that, that you worked on or you you saw um, go through your, your department during your... Oh yeah, your big, big time. Uh, the, well, what the, are the, the impactful the ones? Department. Well, uh, another change, I mentioned that uh, at the time that we were trying to reestablish the geological survey, there was big political change in the province. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the um, huge changes that came out of that was a total revamping of all of the legislation with respect to exploration and mining. Uh, before that time, the province had tended to rely on uh, giving large concessions to fairly to individual companies to explore. And that made the province very beholden to 
a few large companies. Uh, so what we did in the early 70s was to scrap that system and put in place what would have a system that would have looked more similar to what was going on across the rest of Canada, uh, involving uh, uh, putting in place a claim staking system and um, all of the that didn't, the, that didn't exist yet. Claim there, there had been provision for claim staking, but it really wasn't used very much, and we had to totally redesign okay. the system. And I was involved in that. I didn't lead that particularly, but I was certainly involved. It was a very interesting conversation. I enjoy the meetings with, yes. with industry. We we for several years had at the CIM, Newfoundland branch meeting that I mentioned. We would have an annual meeting when we kind of get together with the industry, and take our licks for what we were and weren't doing. And uh, oh, I really enjoyed those meetings. They were they were really a lot of fun because we were making a lot of progress, but the industry always has concerns and. And they would give us hell for a while. And, uh, but yeah, because you can often it was, be, a, it was a very positive relationship overall. Yeah, because you can often, I, I guess, you can be seen as uh, the good guys and sometimes the bad guys. Right. Yeah. On what, yeah uh, right. Yeah. What rules and then eventually we we changed not only the the uh, the claim staking system, the land system, but the whole taxation system changed. Uh, there had to be special provisions put in to deal with these large concession holdings that I talked about. And um, so by the end of, or by the mid, by the end of the 70s, the whole system had been totally changed. And, uh, uh, and it's been really interesting since I retired from government, I've gotten involved in exploration myself uh, through a small exploration company. So it was really interesting to look at it from the other side and really uh, uh, nice to see that it's a very workable system from both perspectives, mm -hmm. both for government and from the point of view of companies. And what's mm -hmm. the name of this company? Uh, it's Cornerstone Capital Resources. It's a company. And what, and what do they? Um, what do they mine? Or well, we don't mine anything. We're an exploration, exploration. company, so we're called a junior a junior mining company. And what do you, what uh, what's what are the target uh, minerals or, or deposits you look for? Well, at the moment we don't have any interest in in Canada at all. We're okay. entirely active in in South America, primarily in Ecuador. But we started the Newfoundland, uh, had numerous projects here over the years uh, that obviously weren't greatly successful, or we, we would still be here. Um, but uh, anything that uh, you can make a dollar in, essentially, okay. we'll. But it's primarily uh, gold, uh, precious metals, and base metals. Okay. Yeah. And uh, having worked for, for for both and with both the government side mm -hmm. and the private side, or the industry side, are there um, what are the big differences um, between both? I hear often also another big difference is having worked uh, in or with academia mm -hmm. versus industry. So mm -hmm. are there big differences? Um, whether they're conflicting or not between uh, the two, the two between sides. government and industry? and industry, yeah. Well, I mean, yes, yes, huge differences. It's a totally different atmosphere. When you're working for government, your your primary role is to advance the aims of of whatever government is in power, and to make sure that the legislation that's in effect is is administered uh, completely and fully and and efficiently and competently. Um, Whereas in industry, of course, uh, um, your your role is to try and make sure your particular company is making money, essentially. Um, but uh, we were able to, when I was with government, we uh, seemed to be able, and I think we're still able in Newfoundland, to work cooperatively with industry. And so it very seldom ended up as a at, as a an antagonistic kind of relationship. It was more a very <coughs> cooperative, working out problems kind of relationship. Okay. One thing that surprises me uh, when I, having left government and working in the private sector, is the kinds of things that are that are hugely problematic for companies like ours. Um, I once thought that that the, the geology of things was the most important factor. Um, 
And of course it is in the sense that if you don't have favorable geology, you don't have deposits. But the, the influence of, um, of politics and markets on what a company can achieve is immense. And uh, I, I wouldn't have expected it to be so important uh, before I left government. Do you have an example of uh, looking at your, the small company now? Well, and how it can uh, right, right now, all small companies are experiencing a hell of a problem trying to raise money. Um, there is no risk money out there. It's very difficult to come across. And lots of companies like ours are going under. It's very difficult to just survive in this atmosphere. So uh, you can have um, a very attractive deposit that, that would be very attractive in normal economic circumstances. But in this environment, it's not worth a hell of a lot because you can't raise money. Okay. Um, here's a loaded question, but again, no, uh, no wrong answer. But that's a, uh, it's a question about <clears throat> how you see uh, the natural resources in Canada, and that's uh, in your opinion, are there any events, people, inventions, uh, disasters, anything whatsoever that that you deem. Um, important that, that you deem it must be discussed when talking about the natural resources in Canada or its history? Well, I, I, I would tend to focus on the things that I am familiar with. Absolutely. In terms of the operating industry, I'm sure that there are particular events that affected the industry's approach to health and safety, uh, you know, um, events like um, changes in steel mill technology that saw huge changes in the iron ore industry. I think that the, the establishment and operation of, of uh, geological surveys is, a, is an extremely important element of the industry. And here in this province, we've certainly seen the benefits of having and, and maintaining a strong geological survey. Um, has paid enormous dividends to what to the province having in the long run. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> last question before our, our closing questions, but that's the question of uh, women. Often there aren't um, there aren't as many women in the natural resource industry as as men, um, but that has, however, changed with time for the for the better. Um, how absent or present were women? throughout your career and how and if that changed? It's changed uh, enormously. Um, early in my career, women were almost absent, certainly absent uh, from levels beyond like secretarial jobs and, you know, uh, the lowest support job. Um, I think when I worked at, at Dosco, for example, my first mining job, I, I, apart from secretaries, I don't think there were any women. Um, the same in the government when I went to work there. But uh, that has changed enormously now. And, uh, I, in geological circles, I think that women outnumber men at the university level. Mm -hmm. And the um, person I went to work, it was a <coughs> field party uh, involving females or um, sometimes now entirely female was unheard of. And now, thankfully, it's, uh, it's, it's quite common. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know you, you now have, um, I mean, in terms of university in general, there mm -hmm. are more, more women graduates, but mm -hmm. um, especially in the STEM mm -hmm. areas, there are more and more mm -hmm. women. Yeah. Um, so this question also could be broad, but I can split it in half. What are you proudest of in life? And we could say in life and also professionally. Um, what am I proudest of? Uh, well, I, I guess I'm, I'm proudest of my, my family, my kids, and, and I've, I've had the opportunity to help um, a few young people along the way, and I've really enjoyed doing that. And I think that's, that's something that I, I feel that has been quite a positive for me. Uh, professionally, it would be my work with the geological survey, the fact that we were able to, uh, that I was involved in a group that was able to 
see, as I said, that we established with the Geological Survey, and that's something that has withstood the, the test of time, uh, is, I think, something that I'm quite proud of. Um, that's about it, I think. <laughs> And um, if you were speaking to someone much younger, like a student, for example, um, what would be the piece of advice or life lesson you could give them regarding uh, their career or, or if they're thinking of the natural resources or not? Um, I don't know. It doesn't pertain to natural resources particularly, but I think um, the most important thing, I think, for young people is to try and understand yourself uh, as well as you can. Understand, know yourself well. Um, and know what you like and what you don't dislike, or more what you dislike rather. Um, I think that too many of us end up doing things kind of willy nilly because we're just not sure where we're going, you know. So if you can, I think it's, it's really important to for young people, for kids, to learn themselves first, and then they can decide from there what career paths are most appropriate for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, is there anything else you'd like to add, you'd like to share, or we missed, or? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, uh, uh, I think I've had a very rewarding career, that, and I got into it somewhat accidentally. Maybe I didn't know myself as well as I should have, uh, but it's turned out very well for me. I've done some interesting things and uh, still enjoying it. Yeah, I, I feel like, um, most people who love their careers, it's it's often accidentally, so mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the uh, uh, my favorite quote, I guess, if I if there is one, is one from Teddy Roosevelt that says, "Do what you can with what you have where you are." In other words, don't spend too much time uh, wishing that you were somewhere else doing something else. Yeah, uh, work with what you've got. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.